Good day. Uh, welcome to another screencast. This screencast will focus on the uh, six basic types of simple machines and how we can use them to accomplish work. Now many of these machines that we've, uh, or the ones that we're going to go through here, are review from uh, earlier grades. So we won't spend too much time looking at uh, what they are, but this will be a good refresher so that you remember uh, what the machines are and what they look like. As well, uh, we're also going to focus on uh, how we can make them um, more efficient uh, by changing them. That will be in a, a later screencast. Okay, uh, but for today, uh, today's learning target, what are the basic types of simple machines and how do they work? A uh, long time ago, and we've already briefly talked about this man, Archimedes. Remember, he was the inventor of the Archimedes screw. Archimedes once said, and I quote, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Now, clearly that's not possible. You can't place the world on a fulcrum like it is in this picture, although it's neat to kind of think of the world just kind of spinning in space and you can just jam a rock and fulcrum under it. But what he was trying to say was that any lever at any length can move just about anything. And Archimedes knew that he was onto something. He knew that machines could help us do work and make things much easier. So for a quick uh, recap here, there are six types of simple machines. We have the lever, the inclined plane, the wedge, the screw, the wheel and axle, and the pulley. So let's take some time to go through each one of these and do a quick review on uh, how they work and what they look like. We're going to start with the lever. Now a lever consists of three basic parts. It consists of a fulcrum which is the pivot point, the, the part that the, full, the lever sits on, a load or resistance force, and then the effort or the force. From here on out, these three shapes, the triangle with the F, the box with the L, and the arrow with the E, are what we're going to use to identify those three parts. So make sure that you write them down somewhere so you're familiar with them. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, exactly what levers do. Well, they help us to use less force when we do a task like when we pull out a nail or we open a bottle or we hit a baseball. Okay? There are three different classes of levers, each helping us to use less force in these situations. The first class lever is as so. We have the fulcrum in the middle and we have the effort and the load on either side. Now the fulcrum can be over this side, the fulcrum can be over on this side. It doesn't matter as long as the fulcrum is in the middle of the uh, setup. Okay? And the effort and load interchangeable. I can put the effort here and the load over there. It, it doesn't matter. Okay, But either way, the fulcrum is in the center. Some examples of some first class levers would be like a crowbar. Okay, Or a pair of scissors with the fulcrum being in the center there. Uh, this is a trebuchet, which is kind of like a catapult, only a little bit different. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example of a trebuchet uh, in class, hopefully, if I can find a, a not broken one. <laughs> Uh, a teeter-totter or a seesaw, this is probably the most common thought of, of uh, first class lever. And then a bottle opener, okay, where you put the, the bottle on this side of the, uh, of the bottle opener. That's your pivot point. And then we use one side with effort and the other side is the load where the bottle is. Okay, so that's a first class lever. Second class lever, this is where the load is in the middle. Okay, again, the load doesn't matter where the load sits. It's between the fulcrum and the effort. Okay. Now this one would have the fulcrum on the end, the effort on the other end, and you'd have to lift this one up. Okay, or you could apply a force to push it up. But either way, the load's going to be supported in the center of this setup. Some examples of this would be like a diving board, where you, the effort's on the edge where you are, the load slightly towards uh, the center and the fulcrum at the end. A wheelbarrow, probably the best example of a second class lever. You carry the load in the center the wheel has a full has the fulcrum or a nutcracker I don't know if you've ever seen a, a traditional nutcracker to open walnuts but that's a, another good example of a second class lever the third class uh, has the effort in the center if you'll notice uh, in each of these three levers in the first second and third uh, as long as you remember what's in the center everything else it uh, doesn't matter okay so in the first class lever you had the fulcrum in the center the second class lever, you had the load in the center. 
And the third class lever has the effort in the center. Again, doesn't matter where it is in between. And the fulcrum and the lever on the load on either side. Okay. Uh, examples of third class levers with the effort in the middle would be like a hammer when you're using it um, as a hammer. Your arm itself is actually a third class lever with the effort being in the middle where your muscle is, the load being whatever's in your hand, and the fulcrum being at your shoulder. And then, of course, a hockey stick. That is a really good example of a third class lever. Remember, the, the load being at the center where the puck is, the effort being where one hand is, and the fulcrum being at the other at the top end where the pivot point is. I think, I think that's how it would work. Uh, if any hockey players want to correct me, uh, be my guest. Okay, so we've moved on past the three levers, and now let's take a look at an inclined plane. Okay, an inclined plane helps us to move very heavy objects higher with very uh, with less effort. Uh, another name for these are ramps. Okay, you can think of like a skateboard ramp. You can think of a uh, uh, it's water slide. Okay, or you can even think of this uh, image here uh, that I'll make a little bit bigger for you. Whoops, let me bring it to the front here. Okay. This here is a picture of a switchback. Okay, you notice how this road goes down the mountain, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. Okay, uh, you could drive straight up the mountain if you wanted. Okay, that would take less time, but more work. If you use a switchback or a series of ramps, inclined planes, it takes you longer to go down because you're going back and forth and back and forth, but it takes less energy. So this is what we call a trade-off. You trade the time for the energy. You give up taking the short amount of time to go up, but in return you get to use less energy using the switchbacks or the ramps. Okay? So that's an inclined plane. A wedge helps us to force or to separate an object. Uh, wedges will usually drive in between in an object down. Uh, think of it like an axe is a good example of a, a wedge. Any kind of knife. Your teeth, great example of a wedge. Okay, Driving something, uh, driving it down into an object to separate it. A screw. Uh, this is essentially, if you think about it, you take a long inclined plane and then wrap it around a pole. That's what a screw is. Okay. A screw, some examples, again, a screw, of course. Uh, drill bits can be examples of screws. Or even this staircase here. See how it's like an inclined plane wrapped around a pole? Now, there's no pole in the picture, but it is essentially just wrapped around the center or an imaginary pole here. Okay. It's an inclined plane wrapped around and around and around. The advantage of using a screw is that it changes what's called rotational energy, the turning energy, into linear energy, the straight. Okay, think of when you put a, a screw into a board, you're turning, okay, or putting a screw into a wall, you're turning, and that's as you turn, the screw goes into a straight motion, goes into the wall or into the board. Okay, linear from rotational energy. A pulley. I think we can all think of some examples from pulleys. It consists of a wire, a rope, or a cable moving around a grooved wheel. Now pulleys help us to change the direction. Okay, we lift down, we pull down on one side, the load lifts on the other. Okay, the load goes from a sitting position on the floor and it changes direction to go to the top of, let's say, a flagpole. Or we have a sailboat lifting weights. These two examples, okay, both use, or all three of these use pulleys. Wheel and axle, it's normally a combination of two wheels of different diameters, and a wheel and axle helps you to increase the amount of force you put in, as well as increase the speed or traveling distance. Now that might be a little confusing, but think of it this way. If you turn your wheel in your car, let's say, you don't have to use much force. Now, I know that's because there's power steering, but your wheel is smaller than the wheel outside. Okay. It helps you increase uh, the, f the amount of force you put in because there's a different size and wheel. And also, we can travel more because we have the wheels on the outside of the car. Okay, uh, Ferris wheel is a good example of a, uh, of a wheel and axle. A uh, screwdriver, even, as you turn it, is a wheel and axle or a doorknob. Those are all examples of uh, wheel and axles. Okay, So here's a recap. Uh, simple machines uh, create giving us an advantage. Now there are four types of advantages that I'd like you to remember. Okay, these four advantages are how simple machines help us. They do one of at least one of the following. They can change the direction of the force. They can multiply the force. They can increase or decrease the speed, 
or they can transfer the force. Okay, so one more time, change in the direction, multiply the force, increase or decrease speed, transfer the force. Okay, so all simple machines do at least one of those. So taking a look at this image here, okay, what type of advantage do you think that the shovel provides? Does it change the direction? It does a little bit, hey, because I have to push down on one side and the other side lifts up. Okay, it also decreases or changes the amount of force that I'm putting in. Okay, because the the shovel is going to do more work than I. Doesn't really increase or decrease speed. Okay, just something to think about. How about this one, the flagpole? Okay, or the wheelchair? We could pick the wheelchair. Didn't think of that, but let's fo focus on the flagpole. Okay, the flagpole changes direction because it has what simple machine inside? It has a pulley. So as you pull down on one side, the flag will go up. So it's a change in direction. Also inc increases the speed. Pulling on the pulley is way faster than trying to do it any other way to raise the flag. A screw. Remember, we talked about changing rotational energy into linear energy. So we have a change in direction. And we also increase the speed. Okay, it's much faster to use a screw uh, like a drill than it is to try and screw something in on, on your own. And lastly, ah, oh, look at the flex on that stick. Check that out. Of course, one of the greater hockey players of our time uh, on one of the best teams, no bias here, best teams in the NHL. Okay, look at the flex on that stick. Okay, this is, like I said, a third class lever, okay, with the load being at the bottom the fulcrum at the top and the effort in the middle. Okay. And what ends up happening is because he's hitting it so hard, so fast, he's able to apply more force in this photo. He's also able to change the direction of the puck and increase speed. Okay. So there's one example of a lever doing many different things. Okay. So that's all I wanted to cover uh, in this. Uh, screencast. Uh, so that's a quick recap on the six simple machines and how each of the six simple machines may provide some sort of advantage.